called Asthma, Bowel, and Cancer, the Boswellia ABCs. Well, actually, there's more letters to the alphabet than that, but those are the ones that fit on this slide. For those of you who are not aware, Boswellia is also sometimes called frankincense. Now, frankincense is often the term used when you're talking about Boswellia as an incense or perfume or being used in aromatherapy as an essential oil. And frankincense has been valued for a very long time. Frankincense can come from any Boswellia tree. And there's Boswellia trees. There's over 100 different species, and many of them grow in the Middle East. And, uh, for example, um, in, in Saudi Arabia, in some of the drier climates, there's also Another type of Boswellia tree that grows in damper climates, which uh, in India and in Southeast Asia. So when we talk about Boswellia used as an internal medication, uh, as an extract, we're very often using those species of trees. But the two words are often used interchangeably. Here's some pictures of the Boswellia serrata tree. And the way that they harvest Boswellia is they cut the tree, so they make a, a mark on the tree with a sharp object, and then the tree weeps a resin, uh, and that resin hardens. And then after a period of time, they come back and they scrape off the resin of the tree. And the types of, the best types of Boswellia, the companies that harvest it use very uh, careful positioning systems so that they don't over harvest an area. They want to make sure that they have a high level of sustainability for this valuable medicine that has been a treasured part of Ayurvedic medicine for over 2,000 years. Here's a picture of what some of the tears look like after scraping the bark. And here's a little bit of the resin in its crude form. Not very pretty for something that yields such magnificent health benefits. Now, when we talk about how Boswellia works in the body, we, many of you may know that it works to reduce inflammation. But the problem with inflammation is it is not one thing. That's why we have this picture of the Mississippi River drainage basin. Because as you can see, look at this, more than almost half of America, a solid third of America, drains into the Mississippi River. So it's streams and tributaries, agricultural runoff, Every drop that falls eventually makes its way, unless it evaporates, it makes its way into the Mississippi River and is eventually deposited in the Gulf of Mexico. And inflammation is often the same thing. It's a river. If the river runs too low, you have a drought situation, and that's not very good. You can't raise your crops. You can't water your crops. You can't water your farm animals. You don't have water for your family to drink. You can't make tea. You can't make coffee. Uh, that's really a difficult situation when the river runs too low. But if the river runs too high and it overflows its banks, you're immediately in a flood situation, and floods can be life-threatening. It can wash away your crops, your farm animals, it can damage your home beyond repair, and it can drown you and your family. So where do we want that river to be? Well, we want it to be in what I like to call the Goldilocks spot. Not too high, not too low, it's just right because your body needs some level of inflammation to perform its tasks correctly. But if that inflammation starts to run too high, you can end up in a life-threatening situation. So we need to keep it in the Goldilocks spot. So how do you control the river? Well, you can't really deal with the river. You have to deal with what feeds the river. So we start to look at these streams and we start to look at these rivulets and tributaries. And so the way that Boswellia works is that it selectively modulates some of the streams. So when we look at this, we see that it may not modulate all the streams, but there's one area that it particularly modulates right here. And we call that the 5-lipoxygenase stream. And if you can reduce the volume of water flowing in that stream, the overall level of the river will go down. So it does not touch every single stream. But there's another herbal that we sometimes talk about in natural medicine called curcumin. And curcumin's mechanism of action is to touch every stream, rivulet, and tributary that feeds the river of inflammation. Boswellia is something of a specialist. Boswellia addresses one area, the 5-lipoxygenase stream. 
So since I am located in sunny Green Bay, Wisconsin, I am required to do a football analogy. Curcumin can play every single position on the football team. It can throw the ball, run the ball, catch the ball, block, tackle. Heck, it can probably even paint the stripes on the football field. Boswellia cannot, but Boswellia is like the best field goal kicker in the entire football league. And sometimes you just cannot win the game without an incredible field goal kicker. So what it does, it does better than any other herbal. And again, we're going to talk more about 5 locks inflammation and why that's implicated in specific diseases. But for right now, just remember that that stream of inflammation is the hardest to address. There is no prescription or over-the-counter non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug like Celebrex or ibuprofen or Motrin or Aleve or Advil. None of those drugs, aspirin, none of those drugs touch 5 locks inflammation. That can be why it is so difficult to address. It often comes as a surprise to some people that there are many flavors of inflammation. And when we look at different disease processes in the body, we need to understand what kind of inflammatory process is taking place before we can design the proper protocol to help those individuals with their specific concerns. So this is a little bit more scientific and less ice creamy graphical representation of 5 locks inflammation. So when we look at 5 locks inflammation, we see that uh, high levels of 5 locks promotes cancer cell growth. Uh, it's been especially noted in prostate cancer. So 5 locks uh, increases inflammatory leukotrains and an expression called 5 heat, H E T E that plays a role in cancer formation and the growth of cancer cells. The other things that 5 locks inflammation is implicated in is intestinal inflammation. So irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel, Crohn's disease, colitis, uh, collagenous colitis, ulcerative colitis, all these have a high level of 5 locks inflammation. When we look at the lungs, the lungs are almost exclusively 5 locks inflammation. So if you're dealing with asthma, or emphysema, or COPD, or a lot of allergic lung reactions, or if you have bronchitis or pneumonia, you're dealing with a high level of 5 locks inflammation in the lungs. Everyone knows that asthma is a disease of inflammation, inflammatory lung disease. So if you have asthma and you have an asthma attack, nobody says take two aspirin and call me in the morning. Nobody says, oh gosh, we better get you on some Motrin pretty fast. To, to quell that inflammation in your lungs. Why isn't that the recommendation? Well, it's because it's not that flavor of inflammation, so it doesn't respond. It does not touch that stream. Now, when we look at joint pain, osteoarthritis, rheumatoid arthritis, gout, there is some five locks expression, but there's several other types of inflammation going on as well. So when we look at addressing joint and other kind of rheumatic pains, we often do combination products that are focused on multiple pathways of inflammation, like a combination, for example, of curcumin and boswellia. But when we're looking at 5 locks inflammation, that's where we are concentrating with higher doses of boswellia because it is uh, so impactful on this 5 lipoxygenase pathway. So what we see is that the arachidonic acid that promotes both leukotrienes and 5-heat is modulated by boswellia. It dramatically inhibits. It doesn't shut it down. Drugs shut things down. And when drugs shut things down, then we get into a difficult situation uh, because that's when you start to have those really terrible adverse effects. But when we say modulate, we mean that it downregulates this type of inflammation. It reins it in without completely stepping on it. Uh, and when you reduce that, you get much better control of pain in the joint, much easier breathing, much more predictable digestion regardless of your inflammatory bowel challenges, and healthier cells that are more resistant to becoming malignant. And if you do have cancer cells, then they are not being stimulated for growth. There's more than one kind of Boswellia. Uh, when we look at selected compounds in Boswellia, there's a whole group of terpenes, boswellic acids, some gum compounds, uh, and they're, they all play together. However, some are definitely more powerful than others. 
So when we look, for example, at acetyl 11 keto beta basalic acid, don't try to say that one three times fast, uh, that's abbreviated ACBA, A-K-B-A. That is the most valuable uh, component in Boswellia. It's not the only one that makes a difference, but it's the one that really shines when it comes to reducing 5 lox inflammation. However, the other acetyl forms, the acetyl alpha and the acetyl beta, uh, these play a role as well. So they're really good family members. However, beta boswellic acid is not a particularly useful boswellic acid. Uh, as many of you may know, Boswellia has been on the market for a long time as a dietary supplement in natural medicine. It's never been a superstar because it works somewhat well, but it's never really been fabulous. One of the reasons it's not fabulous is because it contains beta boswellic acids. So researchers who are looking at the chemistry of Boswellia discovered that there's a compound in Boswellia that actually causes inflammation, and that's beta boswellic acid. So when you take an unstandardized Boswellia product, you have the beta boswellic acid making up about 20% of those valuable compounds pushing in the wrong direction. 80% is pushing in the good direction. So overall, you get a pretty decent uh, benefit, but you're not going to go, oh, wow, and call all your friends and talk about this new natural medicine miracle that's made such a difference in your life. So the scientists wondered what would happen if they took beta boswellic acid out, if they reduced it to insignificant levels, like like 2 or 3% instead of 20%. And what they found is that it dramatically increases the power and the beneficial aspects of the boswellia. Additionally, that ACBA, the acetyl keto 11 beta boswellic acid, what they found with ACBA is that unstandardized boswellia can have as little as 1% ACBA. So when we look at medicinal Boswellia products, a couple of things to keep in mind is to, number one, uh, make sure it's standardized to at least 9 or 10% ACBA so that you're getting a lot of this beneficial compound, that it has the fuller spectrum, and that it has insignificant or it's been purified to reduce some of the beta Boswellic acid. Some of these other uh, Boswellic acids are also not particularly useful, but beta Boswellic acid is the one that's the most problematic. When we look at ACBA and its exposure to uh, an, a scientific model of 5 lox inflammation, we find that uh, there is no 5 lox inhibition by beta boswellic acid. Remember when I said beta is the bad boy? I often jokingly say you can remember BBA, uh, beta boswellic acid, BB, bad boy. So this bad boy does nothing for 5 lox inflammation. So, we, so not only does it promote inflammation, but it's also ineffective in acting with other kinds of inflammation. The, when you look at the 5 lox um, activity, when it is exposed to ACBA, it drops in a very short period of time to virtually nothing. So that's one of the reasons why when I talk about using herbals as natural medicines, and we'll, talk, uh, we'll be talking about diseases in a few minutes, but that's why I spend time on helping people to understand that you have to look for some of these specifications because not all Boswellia is created equal. So when we look at some of the things that we use this for, and we talked about that inflammation in the gut and inflammation in the lungs, uh, especially in the lungs, is almost entirely 5 lox inflammation. <clears throat> well, unfortunately, individuals who have these diseases are prone to have both. So when people have Crohn's disease, if they do have a secondary chronic condition, uh, the most common is asthma. And when people with Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis, were, when they evaluated them for what's their um, percentage of those individuals who have asthma versus people who don't have these diseases, they are 70% more likely to have asthma along with their inflammatory gut disease than people who don't have Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. It's also implicated in psoriasis, rheumatoid arthritis, and multiple sclerosis. If people have these diseases, if they have a secondary chronic condition, uh, it is very often the uh, airway diseases that are associated with 5 lox inflammation. doesn't seem fair, does it? You're already dealing with one adverse situation. You're trying to deal with gut inflammation at the same time as lung inflammation. When you ameliorate the effects of excessive levels of 5 lox inflammation, you're addressing all of it at one time. 
So Boswellia used historically in Ayurveda had a wide variety of uh, diseases and medical situations that they used it for. But when we look at the modern research on Boswellia, it's really honed in on arthritis, asthma, cancer, irritable and inflammatory bowel pain and disease, liver diseases, and heart disease because of the implications of being able to modulate that pathway called the 5 lux pathway. So let's look a little bit at some of the research on these diseases. Boswellia relieves asthma symptoms. So this is a study looking at standard inhalation therapy alone versus standard inhalation therapy plus oral Boswellia. And they found that there was a, they cut, they almost cut in half the need for inhalation therapy by the fourth week of use. So pretty rapidly, they were able to dramatically reduce how often individuals were, had to use their inhaler when they added Boswellia into the mix. In another study looking specifically at asthma, 40 patients who had asthma for at least three years were put on uh, Boswellia three times a day for six weeks versus placebo. 70% of the patients in the Boswellia group improved. Only 20% in the placebo reported any improvement. They had, the people that improved had easier, less labored breathing. They reduced their airway obstructions. They had fewer asthma attacks, and they had an increase in lung function called forced expiratory volume. So when we talk about asthma and emphysema, we're talking about people who, because of the inflammatory processes in their, in their lungs, and in, in emphysema's case, there's also damage that's gone on in the lungs, they cannot exhale as powerfully as an individual who doesn't have these diseases. That means that they tend to hold on to carbon dioxide, which can suppress the breathing response. So it's very, very important to improve expiratory volume or the ability to uh, blow out candles, for example. You know, if there, if there's a reason why when you're watching television and they're, they're hawking drugs for uh, asthma or COPD, that they show people blowing up balloons or blowing up candles, it's because of that reduction in forced expiratory volume. Another bad thing happens when you can't exhale effectively. Then, when, first off, one of the worst things that happens in people with chronic inflammatory diseases is that mucus starts to accumulate because it's harder for them to get things out of their lungs if you have one of these diseases. All of us accumulate a little bit of mucus throughout the day. Everybody coughs once or twice at least during the day, kind of clears whatever little bit of mucus has accumulated in the lungs. If you can't do that, then that starts to accumulate, and a couple of bad things happen. Number one, the mucus starts to sit heavily on these little things in the lungs called alveoli, and that's one of the places where air exchange takes place. Uh, can you imagine if you're trying to open the door and something heavy is resting against it, it becomes more and more difficult to get the door fully open. Another thing that happens is this mucus accumulation, aside from the fact that it's starting to impair good air exchange in the lungs, becomes a perfect breeding ground for bacteria and, and, and sometimes even fungi. So when you have this problem you, with a lot of uh, mucus in the lungs, it becomes a Petri dish. That's why individuals with asthma and individuals with emphysema and chronic obstructive pulmonary disease have much higher rates of developing bronchitis and pneumonia and why it is so serious for them because they have such a difficult time clearing it from the lungs. When you become ill on top of already having an inflammatory lung disease, you've exacerbated the lung disease and that's where people get into some serious, serious issues with breathing. Now, in another looking at Boswellia for gut diseases. So this would be um, irritable bowel, inflammatory bowel, Crohn's, ulcerative colitis, all of these diseases with chronic inflammation in the gut. In an experimental model of creating uh, inflammation in the gut, you'll notice that even when challenged with compounds that cause problems with the intestinal barrier and intestinal inflammation, the group that also received Boswellia were able to keep that level of permeability and that level of inflammation almost back down to normal. 
in another model of irritable bowel syndrome, they found that there was a 72% reduction in subjects with diarrhea in the group that had the highest Boswellia dosage. So this dosage was um, about 400 milligrams versus uh, control, which received no Boswellia at all. In some clinical research on colitis and Crohn's disease, in ulcerative colitis, Boswellia, and this was 350 milligrams three times a day, so about a gram a day for six weeks, compared to the drug sulfasalazine, which is a commonly used drug in ulcerative colitis, 82% of the Boswellia patients who did not receive the drug, they just received the Boswellia, had a remission, which means that went to sleep and they, their bowel function normally for a period of time versus only 75% of the drug group. You know, many people who are not advocates for natural medicine or don't understand it very well, a couple of things I sometimes hear. The first is that, well, it's not like this herbal stuff is clinically studied. Well, they couldn't be more wrong because there are literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of studies in the electronic database of the National Institutes of Health. That's called PubMed. If you're interested in going around and looking up some studies yourself, it's a free website. Uh, that site is P-U-B, like public, M-E-D, like medicine, pubmed.gov. Make sure you make sure it's .gov or government website because if you go .com or some other, you'll end up in a weird place. But uh, pubmed.gov has literally millions and millions of studies, and many of them are on herbal products. The other accusation that's sometimes leveled at the natural products industry is, well, it's not like these herbs and that stuff has been compared to prescription drugs. Au contraire, there are many, many, many studies looking at using herbal medicines, finding that their ability to address diseases equals or exceeds that of prescription drugs almost always with far fewer adverse effects. Now, in another study of chronic colitis with abdominal pain and diarrhea, Boswellia, about a gram a day again, so about 300, three times daily. So, as I said, around 1,000 milligrams a day, which I find a good dose for individuals who are dealing with inflammatory gut disease. Uh, I like to divide it into at least two doses, like one in the morning and one in the evening, so because it usually can provide some intervention for at least 10 or 12 hours. Uh, this was another six-week study compared to the drug sulfasalazine. 18 of the 20 patients in the Boswellia group showed improvement in their symptoms versus only 6 out of 10 in the drug group. In Crohn's disease, 83 patients treated with Boswellia, or another standard drug for inflammatory gut disease, misalazine. Both groups improved, but the Boswellia group experienced fewer side effects. So this is highly effective for individuals who have any of the inflammatory gut diseases. Now, I really feel for people with inflammatory gut diseases because the only drug that will settle them down uh, in an emergency situation are steroids because steroids shut down all inflammation in the body. That's, that's it. But the problem is steroids have horrendous adverse effects if you use them long term. So to use a steroid for asthma or to use a steroid for colitis or Crohn's disease for a week or 10 days because you're having a horrible flare-up, eh, your body can usually deal with that. But having to do it over and over again ongoing is incredibly damaging to the body. It raises blood sugar. It raises blood pressure. It can alter thinking. It can cause bone loss. The list goes on and on. So we really should only reserve steroids for extreme emergency situations. And there are so many other things that we can offer people to help them get control of these terrible symptoms uh, without having to resort, resort to the steroids. Now let's move on to talking a little bit about cancer and some of the studies on why it's important to inhibit or modulate the 5 lox pathway in individuals with cancer. This was a study looking specifically at prostate cancer cells. And as you can see, when you look at uh, reducing uh, the number of, or, of cancer cells, causing cancer cell death, when you use, when you reduce 5 lox inflammation, so the first line 
uh, at 100% cell viability is no intervention. The second line is inhibiting 5 locks um, partially. And the, the third line, the darker green, this is what happens to that, how many cancer cell deaths you can cause when you up the dose, when you double the dose. So you've gone to 100% viability down to about 22% that remain alive and able to procreate. So that's an eight, almost an 80% reduction. Now, another control used ibuprofen. Ibuprofen does not, remember as I said, does not inhibit 5 locks. It doesn't work that way. So it did absolutely nothing. Just another demonstration of the fact that there's more than one flavor of inflammation and you have to have the right tool for the right job. In a study, in an animal model, um, scientific model of pancreatic cancer tumors, we find that Boswellia was able to reduce tumor volume by a whopping 65%. So when we look at a lot of malignancies, that yes, is, it, is Boswellia the only thing I would recommend? No. I would put together a protocol of probably four or five different dietary supplements and natural medicines to help individuals live their healthiest life, uh, to survive the cancer, to help prevent its recurrence, or even in cases where people have cancer that cannot be cured, to help them live longer and healthier lives and improve quality of life. Uh, but when Boswellia has to be a part of that protocol because in certain types of cancer especially, it can just have tremendous, tremendous activity at suppressing cancer cell growth. Here is a, and this is looking at um, a model of leukemia, and it's looking at using Boswellia on its own but compared to the chemotherapeutic agent called 5-fluorouracil, one of the most common chemotherapeutic agents that's used for uh, a variety of different cancers. Now, when they look at putting together an ACPA-rich Boswellia with the 5-FU, you see that that combination uh, is almost seven times more powerful. It dramatically, dramatically increases the ability of the chemotherapy to kill the cancer cell. Here's another looking at combining Boswellia with curcumin, which is an extract of turmeric. So I know this is a very busy graph. Tumor volume means the size of the tumor. Days, pretty self-explanatory. They followed an experimental model of colon cancer for 20 days, so not quite three weeks. The, the control, you'll notice that by the end of 20 days, the tumor volume was very high. So we're going to put a dot over here, about right there. When you look at using curcumin alone, the tumor volume was cut in half, about right here, around 700 versus uh, 1,300. When you look at uh, Boswellia alone, almost the same. The two together uh, was dramatically lower. So when I talk about most cancers, I say that the most powerful combination you can use is curcumin and a Boswellia that has high levels of ACPA and low levels of beta boswellic acid. I think the differences in the tumor volume in this model of colon cancer is very, very dramatic indeed. So what we need to know about Boswellia as I said, it needs to have a goodly amount of ACPA in it. So make sure you're using a standardized herb. That means that we know how much of the good stuff is in there and make sure that it's purified to remove some of the bad stuff. The dosage for most diseases, 500 to 1,000 milligrams a day. Now, if a person has asthma, um, I always have to end with this caveat. Uh, if you have asthma, never, never, never lose your emergency inhaler because while people who don't have asthma think of it as a chronic disease and you might get a little wheezy and you might cough sometimes and struggle for breath, the truth of the matter is is that people every year, uh, thousands of people die of asthma attacks because it becomes so profound and the constriction becomes so debilitating that they actually cannot breathe. So it's always important to have a rescue inhaler. That said, 
uh, if you start to incorporate Boswellia, 500 in the morning, 500 at night, into your protocol, and you may want to talk to your doctor about this. We're not aware of Boswellia interfering with any asthma medications, but just to be on the safe side and to make sure your doctor's on the same page as you, I always encourage people to talk to their healthcare practitioners about integrating natural medicines. So we have had many individuals who have reported to us that they are able to dramatically reduce their daily inhaler use and their oral medication, sometimes even eliminate it with their doctor's oversight. We have one woman who had exercise-induced asthma. Every time she tried to work out or had any kind of exertion where she started to breathe heavily, uh, she went into an asthma attack. She was on a daily inhaler, she was on an oral medication, and she had an emergency inhaler that she was using 10 to 15 times a month. After starting on a Boswellia protocol, she was able to, with her doctor's understanding, get rid of her oral medication, uh, get rid of her daily inhaler, and reduce the use of her emergency inhaler to about once or twice every three months. Uh, she took up kickboxing. She lost 60 pounds. You would not believe her. I've met this woman. You would not believe how fit and active and healthy she looks. You would never suspect that she has this chronic disease. Now, for COPD, uh, also called emphysema, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, emphysema, uh, these individuals have damage in the lungs. This will not cure it. I wish that it would. I would love to help these individuals because it can be a miserable experience to feel like you're not getting enough air. However, if you can alleviate some of that inflammation, you open up more airways in the lungs for better oxygen exchange. So you will feel better, perhaps be able to do more regardless of the disease uh, and help hold its progression at bay. Now, when you're dealing with colitis, irritable bowel, Crohn's, etc., again, Boswellia, to me, is part of a protocol. There's a lot of things that may need to be done, both from a dietary standpoint um, and from a, a natural medicine standpoint, to help people get in their best uh, possible shape. However, looking specifically at the Boswellia and its activity on five blocks, there's nothing I'm aware of uh, that will be able to rein in the inflammation in the gut in the natural medicine world as well as a good standardized Boswellia can do. For cancer, I like to see a combination of both uh, Boswellia as an oral extract, and there are certain frankincense essential oils that are approved for human ingestion. Make sure when you're working with essential oils that they are uh, approved for human use. Uh, you put that together with the Boswellia. They each yield up a little bit of a different uh, variety of compounds from the Boswellia. Uh, putting those together, I think, is highly beneficial for cancer. We don't hear as much about frankincense oil used internally for people who have these issues, but the research is really starting to become very impressive indeed. All right. Well, I thank you uh, for your kind attention. I'm going to have Lexi come back on the line, and maybe we can – I see we've got some questions in the question box, so maybe we can get started with some questions. Well, thank you so much, Cheryl. What amazing information. It's always great to see some research that backs up some traditional uses of a really powerful natural medicine like Boswellia. Now, since we were just talking about frankincense, uh, we've had a couple questions come in regarding is Boswellia the same thing as frankincense? Well, yes and no. You remember when you were in school when they said that all squares are rectangles but not all rectangles are squares? Uh, frankincense is a big word that covers all Boswellia trees. So frankincense is, um, you, can, you can use, a, there's over, as I said earlier, 100 different varieties of Boswellia trees. Uh, we often use that term when we're talking essential oil, perfume, incense. In fact, the origin of the word frankincense means true incense. And the Catholic Church still uses a lot of frankincense in, in many of their, um, when, they, when they use incense as part of the service. But when you talk about Boswellia internally, medicinally, that's generally from most of the research has been done on a specific tree called the Boswellia serrata tree. So when we talk oral medications, I speak Boswellia. When I'm talking about the oil, I'm more likely to use the word frankincense. 
Excellent. Um, another question we just received is, is there an additive effect on inflammation if someone was combining Boswellia with um, an over-the-counter um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory like Elite? There may be. There haven't been a lot of combination studies. Uh, you may get a slightly better effect. But I, as I said, we don't have as much research on the use of Boswellia with non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. There's a little bit of information out there. It certainly would not interfere with the activity of the drug. Now, for someone who is looking to use Boswellia for COPD, they're looking for, you know, some guidelines on dosage and then, you know, roughly how long it takes for them to see some improvement. Uh, generally, I would say for you have some titration issues with Boswellia. Some people may need a little bit more. Some people may need a little bit less. So you may have to experiment until you find the dosage that's right for you. For most individuals, I would say 500 milligrams around that dosage level twice daily. If you have really serious issues, you could go up to three times a day. If you're a very large person, if you're over 250, 300 pounds, if you're a very large person, I would start at three per day. Uh, so as I said, it, it would generally, most people can start with morning and evening. And I would say give it at least two months. You may notice differences a lot earlier than that. But I would say that most individuals will notice a change uh, where they feel like they're just able to breathe a little bit better, having fewer of the adverse uh, effects that happen sometimes when, when you have decreased expiratory volume. So people should start to see a difference within the first eight weeks of use. Uh, someone was wondering if there are supplements out there that contain higher levels of ACPA and lower levels of the beta boswellic acid. Yes, they are. There are, and they're they're in the minority. Most are just unstandardized boswellia in a capsule. So I encourage everybody in attendance today to do two things. One, become an avid label reader. Uh, if that means bringing a pair of cheaters with you to the store, so be it. Uh, whatever it takes, but read the labels. Find out what the standardizations are. Uh, the most expensive dietary supplement we, that you will ever buy in your life is the one that does absolutely nothing for you. And making sure you have the proper clinically studied standardizations can play a huge role in whether or not you're going to get beneficial effects or not. So read the label. Make sure it's standardized for at least 9 or 10% ACPA. Uh, make sure that it has it's purified to reduce that uh, beta boswellic acid. Another thing you can do is to develop a relationship with a high quality uh, health food store. Someone that has someone, uh, some, I know that there's a huge amount of variety amongst health food stores and you might have to visit a few, but find someone who really understands natural medicine. Find a store that's vigilant in um, making sure that the brands they're bringing in are of the highest quality, that there's clinical studies that they can provide for you. Because as a consumer, it's difficult to keep up on all of this. And I think that if you develop a relationship with someone you trust, let them sort some of them out, and then it makes your choices easier. So we received a lot of questions on frankincense essential oil. Now, just to clarify, the research that you were explaining was on Boswellia extract. And can you talk about the specific kind of Boswellia that was used in the research and it was not using frankincense essential oil? Correct. It was Boswellia serrata. Boswellia serrata is an, as an oral extract. It's not frankincense oil. Now, frankincense oil is very popular and it's starting to have some really good research, especially in the realm of cancer. But they're both different types of extractions. And so when I'm dealing with cancer, I like to use both together. I like to have um, a Boswellia from Boswellia serrata that's standardized correctly to be purified of the BBA and to have uh, decent levels of ACPA. And I look for uh, frankincense oil. I especially like the species. There's a Boswellia carteri that has a really good frankincense essential oil. Um, and when you deal with companies, make sure that they're using the form that's approved for internal use because uh, while, inter while essential oils can be incredibly powerful. They're very concentrated. There are some that you shouldn't use internally. So make sure that you ask the right questions that this is the frankincense oil that's meant for internal use. 
Well, I think that wraps it up for our question. So thank you very much, Cheryl, for taking the time to talk about this wonderful information and then answer some of the questions that uh, came up afterwards. And just wanted to let the folks who are listening know that we do have a couple more Terry Talks Nutrition Educational Webinars coming up before the end of the year. So at the, at the end of this month on Wednesday, November 30th at 2 p.m. Central Time, Dr. Jacob Teitelbaum is going to be talking about effective treatment of fibromyalgia using the SHINE protocol. And then Thursday, December 8th at 9.30 a.m. Central Time, Terry Lemerad will be giving a talk about cancer prevention in our hands, not our genes. So the same place that you registered for today's presentation, if you head on back to that terrytalksnutrition.com website, you can register for our upcoming events as well. And just so you know, today's presentation has been recorded and it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. So youtube.com slash terrytalksnutrition. And that has all of our previously recorded webinars available on demand. So you can listen to them in the convenience of your own home, at your, you know, the flexibility of your own schedule. And you can also share them with family or friends that you might think would be interested in this information as well. And if you go to the terrytalksnutrition.com website, you can sign up for a free weekly newsletter. Again, listen to our recordings of our past seminars, and there is a specific space to ask Terry your questions. So if you come up with more questions uh, after today's presentation, you can go to the terrytalksnutrition.com website and uh, ask Terry, and he'd be more than happy to get you an answer. And he's also on Facebook and Twitter. So lots of ways to stay in contact with us and keep up to date with all of the great information and the upcoming webinars that we have. So thank you very much for uh, listening to today's presentation and hope to see you again at one of our upcoming webinars. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you.